conference room number accepted. If you are the organizer, press the star key now. Otherwise, please hold. This line is now muted. This conference will now be recorded. For a menu of available commands, press star 1. There are 11 participants in the conference. 11 years, and uh, other than these last couple of months, I've been a part of uh, the mental health and behavioral health system around the community-based uh, uh, service policy. Uh, prior to coming to the, the, uh, the state to work, I did do some community-based uh, mental health services and substance use services, so uh, I still have that perspective as well that I that, that I bring to this work. So that's my background and uh, what expertise I bring. Uh, so today we are going to walk through uh, as much as I can, talk about um, what MA, what Medicaid pays for with regards to behavioral health services. Um, the second bullet around reimbursement is very complicated. So uh, I'm going to do just some very high level uh, information, uh, give some resources, and then I was hoping uh, maybe for a future webinar get a better idea of some more specifics. Uh, reimbursement, there, there's lot, there are a lot of experts around reimbursement. I am not one of them. Um, so I, I will try to do what I can to at least get you pointed in the right direction. Uh, then we're also going to talk about who can provide services for behavioral health uh, in the community to get Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, and then, like I said, I will be sharing uh, a, a lot of resources, um, like I said, to at least get you pointed in the right direction. And I know that I've spoken with the organizers about a possible future uh, presentation. So uh, I really do encourage you, if you have more specific questions, uh, to, to let us know. So if I do come back in the future, I can be a little more specific. So I did want to run through how services are funded in Minnesota, how community-based mental health services are funded in Minnesota. And although you'll, uh, the focus is around Medicaid and Medicaid billing, uh, for all these other fund sources, we still require the same expertise professional expertise, we still uh, expect the same eligibility requirements uh, for, for individuals to get the service. So uh, we do have mental health grants uh, that we use across the state, and that is a way to help fill the gaps uh, in the service array. Uh, we do, uh, we have initiative grants, which I'll go a little bit into, but that, uh, those grants um, are going typically to uh, counties and regions and uh, not just to fill gaps but also to pay for uninsured and underinsured. Uh, we are sitting much better in Minnesota as we've expanded Medicaid uh, with the uninsured and underinsured uh, population, but uh, we uh, actually haven't seen a huge dip in, in our grants yet for that. So uh, we're still trying to figure out why that is. Uh, as I said, we, uh, Medicaid is what we're focused on today. Uh, Medicaid is a federal pro federal state program uh, where there's matching funds, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through. Uh, county levy dollars are expected. Uh, we are a county-administered state for uh, mental health, and uh, so there are requirements for some county dollars to go into the system. Uh, we have approximately $10 million in federal block grants that also go to, into the system that we use for service array, expansion, piloting, uh, training for providers, et cetera. Of course, there's other grants that we can try for, both at the federal and, and we have uh, state grants that come in every our <laughs> legislative sessions. And then, of course, there's private pay. And the more that uh, we're seeing parity and the more that we're moving into the managed care world, uh, with our Medicaid dollars, uh, we are seeing some private insurance companies paying for things like intensive residential treatment, our arms, our rehab service where they hadn't in the past. So we are seeing a little bit more of the private pay. There's also a law that went into place in 2015 that requires uh, private managed care organizations to pay for uh, crisis services and the crisis services that we offer in Minnesota still having issues with that rolling out at a parity level, uh, but that's uh, something that might be of interest to you as well, to know that that exists and um, and we're trying to get uh, private insurances more on board to follow that law. So what is Medicaid? Uh, 
Medicaid, and I'm starting out here. I teach a class at the U of M for health and mental health policy, and it always interests me as to um, yeah the, the lack of understanding around Medicaid, and it is uh, for you know uh, our for, for the population that I spent my life serving. Uh, it's a very important funding source. So it came out of the uh, in 1965. We've been around uh, this was it's an entitlement program which means uh, you qualify for it uh, due to low income um, children can qualify uh, for it through other disabilities as well though um, and then we also uh, it, it's really it, uh, so Medicare is it covers mostly hospital costs so Medicaid really has expanded uh, what the coverage uh, is and, and um, it is one of uh, um, a principal source of coverage in Minnesota specifically. Uh, Medicaid uh, provides the most significant financing for our hospitals, our community health centers, physicians, et cetera. So uh, it is it is a big it is a big payer in in the system, um, and then it, it limits it limits enrollee out of pocket costs. So the way it goes is, is there's a core set of services we have to offer in order to be Medicaid eligible by the federal level. And then there's a large array of services that are optional. And substance use and mental health services are optional. Of course, Minnesota has one of the most expansive uh, Medicaid options, which include the mental health and substance use. Uh, but I like to bring that to people's awareness because as we you know, go forward if there are budget issues uh, in the future, um, if uh, there's any changes to Medicaid at the federal level and dollars uh, end up being limited, where we end up, where we're going to end up having to look for savings would be in our optional services. Now, I don't think in Minnesota that we're going to, uh, that, that we would uh, sacrifice our mental health and substance use uh, system. However, We'd have to figure we'd have to figure out how to make up that savings. So, uh, as the national conversation around healthcare, we're, we're very interested in, in keeping our eye on that because we could lose uh, a decent amount of money and coverage in the state. Uh, it's the largest programs that serve children and families. When it first came out in 1965, one of the big focus areas was obstetrician uh, in, in delivery. Uh, so, um, that's a big. Uh, 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 section that we cover. Um, also, uh, as I stated, we did, we have moved into uh, more managed care organizations actually managing the Medicaid dollar. We're over, I want to say, 60 to 65 uh, percent of individuals on Medicaid are being served through a managed care organization. Uh, fee for service is what we refer to when uh, DHS, the Healthcare Administration, is actually administering the Medicaid benefit and so uh, that that is so you'll hear fee for service or you might hear managed care or PMAP. PMAP is a prepaid Medicaid assistance program and that's when we uh, move the money to the MCO. Okay so now I'll talk about the community-based behavioral health services. I also want to just bring to your awareness uh, because it is significant in Minnesota. Uh, in 1987 and 1989, that's when we uh, put into law our Minnesota Comprehensive Mental Health Act. 87 was adults, 89 was children. And within this, we mandated that all counties provide an array of mental health services. And this was everything from social services to day treatment uh, to uh, crisis, emergency services, et cetera. So, we are one of only 11 states in the nation that have such a model, uh, and so we're a county-operated state-supervised system. So those mental health grants that I was speaking to earlier, uh, we do have a system in which we uh, send those out to counties slash regions. And I bring that up, too, so that um, there's an awareness when you look at services, um, the county, your county, your region, uh, is supposed to be a resource for you as well and so be able to help you uh, find or connect to services if possible so if that's not uh, a relationship you already have created uh, or it's not strong uh, I definitely uh, always recommend that uh, getting to know your county uh, your county profession your county uh, 
uh, people that work at the county and their resources. Uh, when it comes to mental health and substance use services, there's such a key piece that, that you're going to be uh, lacking some, some knowledge or, or access if you don't do that. Uh, so this is a link that when you don't have my, uh, or when you get the PowerPoint, it, it'll, uh, it will take you to the Adult Mental Health Initiatives map, uh, which is this. So I keep talking about counties and regions. Um, the, the initiatives came into play in the mid-90s as we continued to shut down our state institutions and move to more community-based services. Uh, at that time, in, in 1994, approximately $90 million went into the community base. We, we took it from what we were spending in institutions and we moved it into the community. And at that time, uh, we allowed counties to uh, determine who they wanted to work with uh, as, a, as a region or initiative and then uh, submit what they needed dollars for. We do have some standalone, uh, like Hennepin and, and uh, Ramsey and, and the metro areas have all kind of uh, gone more to a, a single initiative. But um, as you can kind of see, without a lot of the specifics, uh, we have a number of large regions across the state, and then uh, they figure out how to uh, distribute those grants. We also have one reservation in the state that's also an initiative. Uh, about four years back, a law came into play where White Earth uh, was given the legal authority to run their social service and uh, grant any social service grants uh, were supposed to be considered for white earth as well. So, uh, so we do have one reservation. Uh, all the reservations in the other regions, the, the regions are are expected to uh, coordinate with uh, the um, with the different reservation governments and, and such. But as I said, that is really going, to, once again, I'm sharing this information because um, there's still, in, there, there's, still uh, act, there's still a resource for you when it comes to substance use and mental health services. So this slide here is a uh, list around uh, what community adult mental health services are out there that we pay, that we use Medicaid dollars for, uh, or specifically, uh, as with regards to the housing support, the Hasami grant, we only use grant dollars for that. Uh, Drop-ins is another service that, that we don't pay Medicaid dollars for. We only uh, use grants for that. But besides those two, everything else on this list uh, would be available uh, through a Medicaid billable uh, system. Um, in our inpatient hospitals, uh, we have our community hospital, which you all represent. Uh, we did bring some extended stay contract beds online uh, to help pay for some of those longer stays in the community since we've uh, since we lost a lot of those uh, uh, state institutions that did uh, use that, that was used to uh, treat individuals with long term psychiatric needs. And then the CBHHs, the community behavioral health uh, hospitals. Um, are also available. Uh, I mentioned crisis uh, as with regards to parity, but it's also, and with regards to it being a county responsibility to make sure that their county has uh, access to crisis services. On the substance use side, there is a similar law around detox services, which um, it, it doesn't mean that the county has to run it. It means they have to make sure it's offered to to their individuals, which could mean a contract. And I know with, with detox, we've gotten to the point of uh, having much less of that resource. With crisis, uh, in 2015, we did uh, create a law that by the end of 2018, uh, we wanted crisis services to be 24-7 across all 87 uh, counties. And we're pretty close to that. Uh, we do end up having some workforce or, uh, issues in greater Minnesota. Um, and we have had uh, some some issues mostly with the 24-7. But that is something that we're continuing to put more resources towards. There are grants that cover the, uh, the what we call the, the uh, firehouse model. Uh, there's, in order to have a crisis service, you need somebody there 24-7, uh, right? So uh, you can't bill Medicaid unless you actually see somebody. So that's what we have mental, that's what 
but we have some state grants for that are uh, in that other category of grants that uh, goes out to the counties but ends up making it to providers to pay for you know that that uh, the, what it takes to run the business uh, so that they can stay open uh, even if they they don't have someone to bill Medicaid on. Uh, the certified peer specialist, I did uh, I uh, listed that under specific services. Cer certified peer specialist is a Medicaid. We can bill Medicaid for that service. However, the way we have it currently written in law and our state plan with the feds is it has to be offered within one of these services. So I embedded it under the service that it is offered under because that is going to be uh, the only place you can bill for certified peer specialists at this time. Uh, we are working on aligning and, and all our peer work on the children's side. There is a family peer specialist that uh, hasn't never quite rolled out all the way. And, and uh, with family peers, though, it's not something that has to be embedded in a specific service. So we are wanting to move in that direction of uh, having certified peer specialists as just a standalone Medicaid benefit rather than it having to be provided in one of these other, being a subservice within a service. Uh, so we have our residential treatment services in Minnesota. Uh, it's our only, uh, on the mental health side, it's our only uh, residential-based treatment service. We have uh, a sort of community treatment, which was is an evidence-based practice that was created to be a hospital without walls. Uh, in, so the team is made up of uh, what you would uh, see as typical within a hospital setting, uh, but serving individuals in the community and, and um, trying to meet all their needs uh, in the community uh, to keep that tenure. Uh, partial hospitalization uh, is still available, although uh, very limited across the state. Uh, that has to be offered within a hospital setting, and, and so uh, it, it is an outpatient service, but. Uh, well, it could be in a community mental health center. We only have one or two uh, because with partial hospitalization, you have to be Medicare certified, uh, which for a hospital, that's already true. But for our community mental health centers, that's not a requirement that we have for other than partial. So we mostly see partial in hospitalization in hospitals. And then we have uh, targeted case management. This is another service that is connected to the county uh, having a requirement uh, of having not only to offer it, but um, they have to pay the state, they pay the state share of uh, the Medicaid dollar. So uh, I didn't explain it in earlier, but uh, for in general, uh, most of our most of our Medicaid dollars uh, are a 50-50 split with the feds. So for every Medicaid dollar spent, uh, like for ERTS or ACT, uh, generally speaking, we would get uh, 50 cents from the feds, and then the state would put 50 cents forward. In targeted case management, they actually, it's not 50%, but they put forward, I believe, 25% of the state match. Um, I, I could be a little wrong on that, but they do put forward a chunk of the, the state match for targeted case management for that dollar. So the feds would give 50 cents, and then the uh, the county puts dollars forward as well. Uh, what we found as we were uh, looking even more deeply into the spending of our mental health grants is that counties are spending a lot of their uh, regional mental health grants on their county share of TCM. So that's something that we're talking more about because uh, when we ask counties and regions what their needs are, what their greatest needs are, I've never heard anyone tell me it was TCM, um, but yet that's where 45% of our grant dollars are going. So we're working with counties trying to figure out, because being sensitive, that that might be those county levy dollars if they don't come from our state grants, and, and that could uh, really impact budgets and start limiting services again. So, uh, But that's a, a definitely a conversation when we talk about uh, how to pay for, how to identify and pay for needs. Um, if our dollars are going someplace else, other than what our greatest needs are, uh, you know, we have to figure out how to um, how to balance that out without losing services. So adult day treatment is another option. Um, ARMS, the adult rehab mental health services, that's in the community. Uh, certified peers are under that. Uh, ARMS is our rehab option. Um, 
I like to explain to people, even if you broke your leg and you went to a physical therapist, uh, you know, rehab, mental health rehab is a similar concept. Uh, you're going in for rehab because uh, of your mental health symptoms or your mental health diagnosis is impacting your functioning. And so we assess what that impact is and then work towards providing uh, skills training uh, and other supports in order to uh, to move forward and to be more functioning and in, in, uh, how that individual wants to um, function in their life. Medication management, we actually don't call it that anymore, but I keep using that term because it's what most people um, refer to it or still know it as, but that's our psychiatry. Um, psychotherapy is one of our services as well. Uh, we are one of few states that pay for dialectical behavioral therapy as a separate service rather than just under psychotherapy, and we do have uh, approximately 40 certified uh, programs across the state. Housing supports, uh, the Hassami um, that grant, uh, that is um, a best practice, evidence-based practice around uh, how to provide support around housing, uh, but also provide support with getting people into other services and supports so that that holistic, review, uh, holistic view or holistic needs of an individual is met because uh, we see people are more likely to stay in stable housing when uh, you know, more of their needs are met uh, around mental health, around uh, physical health, around uh, other um, employment, et cetera. And then drop-ins, we have very few of those left in the state. Uh, drop-in services, day treatment, psychotherapy, those used to be our core services across the state. And now you can see we have uh, a large array of services that we've expanded. Um, case management was on there too. But uh, so drop-in centers, the counties, there are counties that, uh, have, very, that have very robust uh, drop-in centers, still do have them. Um, they, there are some grant dollars from the state going into that. A lot of counties are using their own dollars. So here's the children's uh, mental health services that are in the community. Uh, I, sorry, I didn't type out the PRTS, but that's Psychiatric Residential Treatment Facilities. And that is uh, a similar service to our ERPS on the adult side, our Intensive Residential Treatment Services. And that uh, is very much focused on treatment. Um, right now, what, uh, we have one PRTS uh, up with 40 beds, and we have another one coming uh, on board uh, soon. And we're hoping this legislative session to uh, to, to receive more dollars and permission to extend uh, to get more PRTS on the line. Uh, one of the things to, uh, that to understand is that we have to go to the legislature to ask for dollars in order to uh, be able to expand or create a new Medicaid service. And that is because of that, that match, that, that uh, generally speaking, that 50-50 match. So, uh, we might have a great idea and we might have a lot of great providers, but unless the state legislature says, uh, yep, we're willing to put some dollars forward for that, we can't move forward um, until the state gives us that permission. So this legislative session, we do have uh, a request forward around getting more dollars to expand PRTS. Uh, children's Therapeutic Service and Support, that's similar to our rehab service, our arms service on the adult side. Uh, however, what's, a, what's different about the children's CTSS is that they have psychotherapy uh, embedded in it, where on the adult side it's rehab only. We do have school link based services. That is right now currently an all grant paid program, uh, but we are looking at uh, if there's ways to blend more of that into Medicaid, uh, but, but that uh, is embedding within the school system, the therapist, uh, that uh, are other uh, supports um, so that children don't have to leave the school if they um, need to see a therapist or, or have an assessment. So it helps keep that stability within the school. CTSS is also already offered in the school. Uh, so that is that could be billed through Medicaid, the CTSS in school. But the school linked mental health services are, are um, I guess, for services that are outside CTSS. Uh, or providers that are not CTSS certified, they could end up coming in through this grant. 
Uh, Behavioral Health Homes PCM is, is similar to, to, to adults. Behavioral Health Homes is a newer service uh, that is both for children and adults, and that is more around coordination. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it's, you can't have targeted case management and behavioral health homes because at the end of the day, it, it's a similar outcome that we're looking for in that. Uh, but with behavioral health homes, there's a, a team approach to being able to provide that service. So uh, with behavioral health homes, um, it, it, uh, it is looked at as, as a likely a more shorter term, uh, intense at the first six months, and then start to, to back away. But helping to get individuals into uh, not just mental health and substance use care, but also focusing uh, on um, physical health care as well. So uh, outpatient services, uh, I, I have another slide coming up which describes that a little bit more. Uh, Youth Act is uh, our similar service to, to ACT on the adult side. Um, and we are doing some uh, adjustments to, to that model, uh, trying to increase. Right now we only have four providers. So we're trying to make some adjustments and, and figure out how to expand that. Uh, crisis on the children's side, there's no residential for crisis where there is on the adult side. There is a little bit of crisis respite dollars out there that runs through the county, uh, but uh, there, at this point in time, there's no residential. But that is a model that we want to be able to bring up in Minnesota. Intensive treatment foster care is a newer benefit as well, and that uh, is a, adjusting um, how we provide uh, services to children in foster care, to the, the biological parents, to the foster parents. That's another one that we're trying to increase across the state. We currently only have three or four providers. And then the early intensive developmental and behavioral intervention, that's actually under our waiver service, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, in a bit here. Uh, but it also uh, involves some skills building that surround mental health. It, it's really around treating individuals uh, with an uh, autism diagnosis or some uh, a diagnosis within the autism spectrum. Uh, that's the focused population for uh, the EIDBI benefits. As I stated, here's the outpatient rule uh, for uh, that we, we updated this in 2011. Within this rule, uh, it is uh, written for both adults and children. If there was something specific to children, we uh, did specify, or if there was something to adults, we would specify that. If not specified, everything is uh, for adults and children. Uh, underneath that, if you are interested, is the actual rule citation. But this is the rule that has our diagnostic assessment, uh, psychotherapy language, medication management, et cetera. Uh, for diagnostic assessment, what I would just uh, remind uh, people is it is a service in and of itself. Uh, in Minnesota we, and in most states, we use that diagnostic assessment uh, in a twofold way. It's a service in and of itself to determine a diagnosis. However, it's required to have a diagnosis and to have a diagnostic assessment in order to be eligible for a number of our services. Uh, so sometimes that gets a little confusing, um, especially when we talk about uh, if you had a diagnostic assessment done by one provider getting that diagnostic to the arms provider or to another provider rather than having that individual sit through another assessment. There's not always that understanding that those diagnostic assessments, as long as it's still uh, valid, um, it, they need to be updated or redone annually. Um, and if there's not a significant change for the individual, for one year, that one assessment can be used to determine eligibility and number of services. There's no reason uh, for that specific purpose to redo diagnostic assessments. We are looking more too as we uh, are looking into what we call uniform service standards that we are looking to, to create uh, more streamlined and clear uh, laws around our community-based mental health system. And as part of that, we, are, uh, we have looked more at the use of uh, the physical and health uh, assessments that come out of hospitals. Uh, looking at whether or not that could at least do some preliminary eligibility, uh, work for some preliminary eligibility while we uh, work on getting a diagnostic. So uh, we continue to look at ways to increase access to services instead of creating barriers. And, and I know that's one conversation that uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time on 
uh, trying to uh, come up with some solutions uh, because there is quite a bit of information uh, that that are in those assessments. Um, typically, it, it I mean it doesn't follow our same uh, same intense focus of a diagnostic assessment. Uh, so that's why we uh, would consider it possibly only for that initial or, or just to get in the door and then uh, shortly thereafter get a diagnostic. So I've already talked about housing, but there are a number of other support needs for individuals in order for uh, an individual to be successful in life. And this is true whether or not you have a mental health diagnosis or not. Uh, you know, some of us don't, uh, we, we might need uh, the stability and the employment, the housing, et cetera, uh, and, if, and we can do that on our own. And if we can't, though, uh, that's where some of these other services like waivers come into play. Uh, waivers uh, are, are paid through Medicaid. Uh, the waiver system through Medicaid was created uh, as a way to, to put more money into the community. Uh, Essentially, a waiver is once you go through the assessment, it's saying you meet nursing home level of care, uh, but we're going to quote unquote waive that because we want to keep you in the community. And so then those waiver services, those Medicaid waiver services or grant paid waiver services, then pay to help keep people in the community. Um, and that could be personal care assistance, but that might mean uh, other services such as um, adult foster homes uh, or foster uh waiver foster homes in general. Uh, that's, that's one service under the waiver. Um, there's also some employment benefits that are newer under the waiver. Uh, transportation is covered uh, as a Medicaid in, uh, in general, uh, and that is another area too that I know that there's work going on in greater Minnesota around uh, some regional collaboration around trying to improve transportation options for individuals. Um, and then we all need, uh, some level of, of socialness, of uh, acceptance, uh, you know, family, uh, caregiver support. Um, we as human beings do much better when we have that. So uh, through some of these waiver services and, and uh, other uh, grants that we have, uh, we can, uh, or Medicaid services in general, like transportation, paying for that, uh, you know, we do, if, if, if it works out well, uh, we do have the ability to to provide a holistic picture for an individual. However, we, we find most, we find very often that we have a very siloed system where it's very confusing and difficult to get that holistic model. Uh, but uh, what I do want to stress is that we do have those, we do have uh, the services and, and uh, supports in our system that could do that. Uh, so figuring out how to now make that work uh, better it is definitely a, a focus of, uh, of us at DHS, not just within the mental health, but also within the disability services who oversees the waivers, as well as the healthcare system, who our healthcare administration that also deals with uh, the Medicaid funding. Uh, certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics is uh, that's a um, link there that you can. Uh, when, when I'm uh, done, or when you get the, the slideshow, hopefully you can access that link. That link will take you to this page, and this is uh, out of our provider manual, our uh, MHCP, Minnesota Healthcare Provider Manual. Uh, certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics were one of eight states that were given dollars, uh, Medicaid dollars and grant dollars, in order to, uh, to, to demonstrate or bring up uh, these certified behavioral health clinics. And they are uh, our community mental health centers, uh, which sprung up uh, in uh, the I believe, early 80s. Uh, this, is a, this is an attempt to uh, bring them into uh, the, the, the current century and look at uh, not only being able to look at or assess a holistic uh, view of an individual, get them connected to that, but then also we are looking at how do we pay for that in a, uh, so that providers are able to keep their doors open. Community-based substance use, I'm really not going to spend a lot of time on that because we are going through a major transition in moving our uh, substance use services uh, to look more like mental health with regards to access. Uh, currently, we do have 
Um, we, uh, right now, you, uh, in order to use Medicaid dollars, uh, you get an assessment through the CCDTF fund. Uh, and then uh, what we have currently is, is residential or outpatient uh, therapies uh, within, you know, very residential uh, type settings, even with, even, you know, or a um, outpatient clinic. But it has to be within this, this group um, or within a licensed setting versus individual. So on the mental health side, as I mentioned, I'm a mental health professional. I can bill Medicaid services once I get you know, connected with uh, and credentialed under the state. Uh, I can do individual services that my license allows. Um, for LADCs within the substance use world, what we're moving towards is them being able to do more individual service in a clinic or in like their own office versus only in a licensed facility. So broadening uh, accessibility that way, uh, we are moving away from uh, the county being the placing authority and moving towards uh, providers being able to refer as uh, we see in mental health. Um, and then we're also trying to bring up um, the medication management and the peer work within uh, the reform. So uh, there's a lot of moving pieces, and it's uh, there's there's a, there's so little of it up right now that I don't want to go into any more details than that. But what I did provide you was a link to this page. That link that was on the previous slide does uh, bring you to this page, which breaks down the substance use disorder reform work, and there's a FAQ. Uh, with the most current, um, with the most most current information of where we are with regards to the implementation. So the provider of services. Uh, this is a list of uh, everybody who qualifies as a mental health professional within the state of Minnesota. Once you receive the handout, those are uh, links that you should be able to access. Uh, so. Um, we do have a, a, a decent array of uh, mental health professional options. And uh, um, as you see with the tribal certified professionals, tribes do have uh, the ability to also determine uh, who qualifies as a, as a professional uh, and do a certification there. Uh, and then we would pay Medicaid. But that would have to be within a uh, reservation tribal system. Then we have other staffing levels. We have, uh, I've been talking a lot about the peers, uh, but we have rehab workers on uh, the adult side, and then we have uh, practitioners. We have both uh, a regular practitioner, but we also, uh, in that outpatient rule, brought up clinical trainees, which is a way to uh, allow more practice um, uh, while someone is working towards their own professional licensure. Uh, mental health behavioral aid, that's in CTSS. That would be similar to the rehab worker in uh, in the armed service. Uh, those are individuals that are coming in with less experience, so they would require more supervision, more training, uh, but they are able to do a number of the services as well. And then we have the case managers uh, and case manager associates. So professionals in rehab or mental health practitioners are uh, and psychiatrists or, or prescribers are our big providers in the state. So there are many ways in which to get reimbursed for uh, Medicaid services. And this, if you're interested, is the federal law that uh, breaks out the different considerations for reimbursement. Um, the other resources here are the um, provider manual homepage, which will actually explain how to get reimbursed, uh, what codes to use, um, breaks down the, the uh, um, whether it's a unit or such. So there's, there's a multiple ways in which uh, uh, we determine rates within the Medicaid uh, world. And it, it's so, um, and I'm just new into the hospital world, and that, that's an even uh, more complicated uh, process. Uh, just to get to the base rate, and then there's all the supplementals on top of that. So uh, this has definitely been a very eye-opening uh, uh, learning experience for me, having come from mental health. But uh, we do have, at the uh, national level, uh, we do have codes uh, that we're required to use. 
Um, and so as that rolls out, that, you know, that, that uh, determines uh, what we can uh, bill for, even how much, uh, what we can charge, uh, or what we can pay, sorry, what we can pay. Um, so, uh, so I, it's really, it's really, it was difficult for me as I was preparing for this to, to get to any sort of level of specifics. Uh, so other than, you know, figuring out base rates uh, or using national standards, uh, one of the other things that we do, uh, the, the certified community uh, behavioral health clinic pilot uh, is looking at how to do some costs, uh, how to, after the fact, cover uh, costs. That, that weren't covered with the billing, so looking at uh, cost and, and payment and then doing a reconciliation on that. Our intensive residential treatment and our assertive community treatment providers, they use uh, a cost-based process in which providers submit to us a cost report, and then uh, we have parameters around how much we can pay for administration uh, costs or, or for uh, the, the bricks and mortar, uh, but it's through that process that we determine a rate. So within ERTS and ACT, all of them have individual rates, where like with psychotherapy or DBT, we have a set rate for any provider. Uh, Youth ACT, uh, they determined that rate based on regional uh, fiscal uh, averages, and beyond that, I, I, uh, I, I lack any other understanding to go into any detail around that. But that's part of that conversation that we're having with providers as well. Uh, did that make sense? Uh, if, if that still makes sense uh, and is still paying enough, uh, you know, fine. If not, are there some other options there? So, um, so that is something that, that uh, we continue to, to look at. So. Um, there's all, these pages are just uh, meant to be resources. I would always re uh, suggest bookmarking uh, any of these pages. Our MHCP provider manual, our, our Minnesota Healthcare Provider Manual, is, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's like going to Blue Cross Blue Shield Provider Manual. So this, this is the manual that breaks out uh, what services we offer, who can offer it, uh, how do individuals become eligible for it, and then breaks down the payment codes and, and such. And so this is just a screenshot of what the home page would look like. And on the left-hand navigation, uh, you would find uh, substance use services, mental health services, uh, and each service has uh, its own page or breakdown. The providers also, those, those slides, that, that have the breakdown of the providers, those have all come from the provider manual. Uh, so that has the information about how do you qualify to be at that provider level and then what, it, what you can provide underneath it. So the provider manual really is uh, a key piece to at least start. Um, and what I'm hoping moving forward here, uh, if I do another presentation or if I find someone else to do a presentation for you, um, if there are more specifics, I'm hoping maybe if you aren't already using the provider manual, more time in there might refine some of the questions so we can uh, be, be more uh, focused on, on the information that you would find helpful. Um, other resources out there, we have uh, the bed tracker has been around for a little bit. Uh, the Minnesota Hospital Association uh, holds a grant for us. They created this for us in 2007 and continue to maintain it. This is where uh, hospitals can uh, go in and log uh, not only how many psych beds they have, but how many of them are open, um, if they have any specialization in their, their uh, psych uh, beds. Um, that's uh, where that information would be. It is at this point, it, it's uh, not required of hospitals, it's optional. Um, there are processes in which to remind people to do updates. Uh, we ideally want them done every eight hours, so it's as real time as possible. Uh, but it, it's, it varies as with regards to, um, to that, but we still continue to hear that there is some usefulness for it. Uh, we also have created Fast Tracker, which is more about community uh, services for both children and substance use. That's much newer, uh, and it really is less about beds and more about services. And then the DB101 is Disabilities 101, and that really can get you to, that's this one right here, that one can uh, take you to all sorts of uh, information uh, that includes more of the waiver world, 
uh, services, but then also uh, housing and, and uh, food stamps and other. I mean, like it, it's just uh, kind of anything that you might need. And then it does it by uh, within a regional area. Uh, I believe you, you put your zip code, and it will bring you to uh, to something that's that's um, available within your area, your county, your region. So uh, so that is so these are just screenshots of what they uh, what those sites look like. But those are definitely that these are meant to be resources uh, for both providers and for individuals. Uh, the, the Minnesota, the bed tracker, which is this one here, that one can only be used by providers. Uh, we are we don't allow community members to do that. But these other two, the fast tracker and the uh, DB101, those are open to anyone. So uh, any consumer family member, provider, county can use that as a resource. So with that, uh, I guess one of the other things that I didn't uh, mention when, with regards to the payment is I did uh, mention that Minnesota was an expansion state. And so uh, when we expanded uh, as, under the Affordable Care Act, what that allowed, the Affordable Care Act allowed us to go above uh, a certain uh, number above the poverty line. Uh, we actually uh, went a little above what the feds allowed us to do. Uh, and what that ended up uh, uh, opening up in Minnesota is more coverage. Uh, what we found is uh, young adult white males are who we really expanded our coverage for through uh, the expansion of Medicaid. With the expansion of Medicaid, what that gives us uh, currently indefinitely uh, is a 90-10 match. With the federal government. So as I mentioned before, generally speaking, there's a 50-50 match for every Medicaid dollar, but on anybody that we have expanded, we actually get a 90-10 match. So 90% of that dollar, 90 cents comes from the feds and 10 cents comes uh, from, the, from the state. So, uh, and that's regardless of what service, it's more about whether or not they're an individual that's part of the expansion versus service. So that's why there's no cut and dry black and white um, rule on the 50-50. Uh, the CCBHC, I believe, is at a 65-35 um, uh, match um, uh, from the feds being the higher. So. Um, depending on, on what we're demonstrating or trying to do or what the feds might be incentivizing at the time, uh, can change that, that match piece. Um, and where that gets significant is when we start talking about the budget, when we start talking about expanding services. Uh, as we've created more Medicaid services in the state, I mentioned earlier on that uh, $90 million as we were closing down state institutions went into the community-based program. As we continue to expand Medicaid, however, we've taken dollars from that grant pool in order to offer that up as uh, quote-unquote savings with the legislature. So, uh, so over time, we've gone from 90 down to 40, and uh, those dollars were negotiating tools uh, to uh, get the state legislature to approve uh, state portion of, of dollars. Once we get state legislative approval, then we have to go to the feds, and we there's a couple different ways that we ask the feds permission to uh, get that federal match as Medicaid, and that's through state plan amendments or these waiver plans. Um, so, uh, so there's a lot of hoops to jump through, and that's why sometimes if you're starting a brand new service, it can take uh, two to three years to get something like that totally up and running. So. So with that, I know I'm a little under time. I'm not, if there's questions, i uh, be more than happy to answer that. Thank you so much, Carol. What a great presentation. If anyone does have any questions, you can feel free to type your question into the chat box. Or if you're called into the phone line, you can press star 2 to unmute. And um, we can talk to Carol here in the last few minutes. If you haven't done so already, if you could complete the post-presentation poll on the screen, it's the exact same question we asked at the beginning of the call. All right, it doesn't look like we have anyone typing into the chat box. Um, okay. That's a sign well, of I a very it. thorough presentation. 
<laughs> well, I hope it was helpful. And uh, if, uh, like I said, if, if it sparks more questions or uh, you have more ideas of what specificity you'd be interested in, mm -hmm. um, uh, please let me know. And like I said, even if I'm not the expert, I'd be more than happy to connect you with someone who might be able to to provide you all with that that information. We really uh, value. Uh, the work that you all do and uh, want to be able to support and give you the information uh, so you have what you, you need to serve our individuals. Thank you. Oh, great. Thanks, Carol. And maybe that's a question we could pose now. If there is any topic or um, expansion on anything that Carol touched on today or anything that would be helpful for future webinars or, or future references for you. Um, if you want to tap the, or type anything into the chat box, um, 